Last weekend, paramilitary forces of the Russian FSB intercepted two small Ukrainian naval vessels and a tugboat attempting to pass through the Strait of Kerch. The Ukrainian vessels were navigating from the Black Sea port city of Odessa to Mariupol on the coast of the Sea of Azov when the incident occurred. Now, with at least three injured Ukrainian sailors, both parties are pointing the finger at each other. Yet, whoever is right, the naval standoff illustrates the importance of the Kerch Strait and the Sea of Azov. I'm your host Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. Before we continue, we would like to thank our sponsor Vikings War of Clans, which was inspired by the famous strategy games of the 1990s we all loved like Age of Empires and the Command and Conquer series. Now if you want to relive those memories or create new ones, this game with pretty impressive graphics may just be what you're looking for. You get to reign over empires, fight over resources, forge new alliances and compete in massive life battles against friends or NPCs. Support our channel by downloading Vikings free from the links in the description and get the special bonus of 200 gold coins and a protective shield. The Strait of Kerch is a strategic passage that connects the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov while separating the Russian mainland from the Crimean Peninsula. At its narrowest crossing, the strait is a little over 3 kilometers wide, while its depth is about 18 meters. According to the terms of an agreement between Russia and Ukraine dating to December 2003, both sides have the right to access and patrol the area. However, the Kremlin argues that its annexation of Crimea in 2014 invalidates the 2003 agreement with Ukraine and that the area surrounding the Kerch Strait is effectively part of Russia's territorial waters. Under these circumstances, in April 2015, the Kremlin began constructing a controversial bridge that would connect its mainland to Crimea. Since then, Russian and Ukrainian coast guards have been at each other's throats. Both sides have stopped and detained civilian and commercial ships that navigated over their respective claims. By one account, since July 2018, Russian forces have stopped and boarded as many as 148 ships sailing to Ukrainian ports. What changed recently is that six months ago, the long-awaited Russian bridge officially opened. At a length of 19 kilometers, the pair of parallel bridges is an impressive display of engineering, but at a height of only 33 meters, it physically restricts access to the Sea of Azov for medium-large Panamax freighters. In the past, such cargo vessels accounted for a quarter of Ukraine's total maritime traffic in the Sea of Azov. Now, due to the Russian bridge, that traffic has diminished. The Ukrainian ports in Berdyansk and Mariupol in the Sea of Azov, through which steel and agricultural products are exported, substituted for the cargo traffic that previously went to ports in Crimea. But since the construction of the Russian bridge, the two Ukrainian ports have taken a blow. It goes without saying that Russia's de facto maritime blockade hurts the overall economy of Ukraine. In response, the cabinet of Ukrainian president Petro Poroshenko is currently working on a legal case against Moscow in international courts. Having said that, even if the results of the legal case are in favor of Ukraine, it is unlikely to change the situation on the ground. Given all these developments in the proximity of the Kerch Strait and the Sea of Azov, the incident that occurred on November 25th was long in the making. Immediately after the assault, the government in Kiev condemned Russia's actions and accused it of military aggression. Ukrainian officials insist on their freedom of navigation crossing the Strait of Kerch, as is provided by the 2003 agreement. This is also the standpoint of the international community, since nearly all countries recognize Crimea as Ukraine's territory. Meanwhile, Russian officials say that the waters surrounding Kerch are part of its sovereignty and that the Ukrainian vessels were making dangerous maneuvers when they illegally entered its territorial waters, which forced the Russians to act. 
Either way, following the skirmish, diplomats from Kiev and Moscow requested an urgent meeting of the UN Security Council and have been arguing ever since. Now, as is often the case with these kinds of incidents, facts are hard to come by. So, as outsiders, we can only speculate. And by comparison to Russia, Ukraine has greater reasons to provoke a conflict. Foremost, since the start of the Ukrainian crisis, things haven't turned out well for Kiev. Russia has been steadily bolstering its overt and covert military presence in Crimea. And there are signs that the Russians are preparing for a larger showdown in eastern Ukraine. On top of that, the economy of Ukraine is faltering, with the government having recently renewed its terms with the IMF to cope with the increasing interest payments. Beyond economics, Ukraine's military capabilities are severely limited when compared to Russia. To make a long story short, there is little Ukraine can do against Russia. The only way for Kiev to beat Moscow is for Ukraine to draw the Europeans and the Americans deeper in the fight against Russia. And it just so happens that a few days before the naval incident, President Putin was scheduled to meet with President Trump at the G20 summit in Argentina, which would have been the Russian president's latest attempt to improve relations and reduce US sanctions. Since this is a top priority for the Russians, it is unlikely that they were looking for a political scandal ahead of the summit. This is not to say that the Russian leadership did not contribute to the tensions in the Sea of Azov, but at the time of the incident, the Ukrainians had greater reasons to start a fight. For instance, should the United States settle on a deal with Russia that leaves the Russians in control of Crimea and eastern Ukraine, it would spell disaster for Kiev with long-term implications. This gives Kiev credible motive to provoke an international incident to force the hand of Putin and Trump ahead of the G20 summit. The payoff of such a move would either mean additional Western pressure on Russia through new sanctions or a batch of new lethal military hardware. It's also noteworthy to mention that beyond the prism of diplomacy and security, Ukraine is preparing for presidential elections in March 2019. However, the latest polls are not looking favorable for local politicians, as no single candidate has more than 30% approval. President Poroshenko is therefore at risk of losing the upcoming election. In that view, Poroshenko's declaration of martial law along the coastal provinces following the naval incident could serve as a means to reshape the electoral results. This is a claim made by some Ukrainian opposition parties. And what makes the whole affair even more intriguing are the obscure provisions of the martial law. With the martial law in effect, Poroshenko technically reserves the right to regulate telecommunications, radio and the press. The martial law also permits him from postponing presidential elections. All these procedures give the sitting president substantial political leverage. But whether this is a real motive will only be revealed if those measures are enforced. In the large scheme of things, there are geopolitical considerations as well. Ukraine is the soft underbelly of Russia. While the affairs of Belarus and Moldova are largely shaped by the Kremlin, Poland, Romania and the Baltic states are NATO members and enjoy security guarantees. Ukraine, therefore, sits at the forefront in the geopolitical struggle between Russia and the West. Moreover, despite all the posturing by European and American policymakers, the Russians are better prepared for a fight. This is mostly because Moscow has genuine security needs in Eastern Europe. The geography of the European plain is such that it expands like a triangle to the east. The more the triangle of flat terrain widens, the thinner Russian forces are stretched, because they have to secure more land. So the Kremlin's geopolitical objective is to push west and restrict the options of NATO. 
By anchoring itself by the Baltic Sea and the Carpathian Mountains, Russia gains the ability to concentrate its forces along those geographic points. With fewer fixed locations to safeguard, the Kremlin preserves manpower, capital, etc. In this context, the outcome of the Ukrainian crisis is fundamental to the long-term geopolitical interests of Russia. This explains why Russia views Ukraine as part of its sphere of influence and is willing to violate international rulings and to risk isolation. The Americans are fully aware of this vulnerability and since the Euromaidan revolution, the United States has stepped up its military aid to Ukraine, sending the country sophisticated lethal weaponry. The American aid hasn't yet altered the balance of power, but how Washington acts in support of Kiev will be crucial in the growing tensions in the Sea of Azov. The wrong move could escalate a broader military engagement, and that ultimately is the greatest risk in the stalemate in Ukraine. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. Credit goes to our Patreon community for enabling us to generate funds to cover expenses and bring in additional help with research and editing. Overall, Patreon permits us to release reports on a regular base. Now, if you want to join our community, visit patreon.com slash caspianreport. For now, thank you for your time and sawol.